Okay, hi everybody. Uh, this is Seth, Head of Operations here at COIN, and I'm here joined this evening by Conrad Lin from the Fintrucks Project. Welcome, Conrad. Thank you, Seth. It's good to be here. Great, great to have you here. So I know you just flew in late last night, mm -hmm. and uh, we're here in our office here in Tokyo. Um, for those who are not aware, um, we're really proud and excited to have the Fintrucks um, Project be part of the COIN family. Um, the FTX token went live on Coin, on, sorry, on Cryptos last night. We started trading um, FTX pairs against BTC and ETH, and we see a very lively market thus far. And um, we're really excited to have you here and to tell more about the project. Well, thank you, Seth. Uh, again, I'm very happy to be here. And you guys have a fantastic office, <laughs> and I'm hearing you guys are moving soon as well. We are. We are. Um, so you'll have to come back a second time when we're in um, fancier digs, I'd say. Perfect. So I'm really you know, excited about this project, really, from the first time I heard about it. But before we go into the project, um, I want to know more about yourself and really what you were doing before you became CMO of Fintrux. And if you could also tell us maybe the first time you did a Bitcoin transaction. Right. Well, there's a lot of history there, actually. It's quite interesting. Um, I was, for the most part, in school. I was in pre-med, um, going in, uh, uh, studying neuroscience and psychology. And at that time, my goals were very aligned to you know, wanting to help people by being a medical doctor. Um, but, you know, as side jobs go, I was uh, doing a lot of different um, gigs. Um, I tried doing marketing, I was doing business development at one point, and I was, uh, you know, I ended up seeing a lot of different opportunities that uh, came about. Um, and, you know, when Fintrux was an, as an idea came to uh, one of the um, companies I was working with, uh, Robocoder at the time, uh, you know, I was offered a chance to help head it up and uh, be the marketing lead or the CMO um, of that project and help bring it into the blockchain space. Um, for those that don't know Robocoder, uh, it's a, a software company that's in Canada and it currently serves over 90% of the securization market in Canada, which is bulk funding. Uh, pretty much all the big banks and insurance companies use our products uh, and we manage several bills of dollars of ads that support them. Now, um, we wanted to bring that uh, securization um, essentially, you know, with having those, it's a bulk transactions, you know, selling bulk uh, loans to the banks and et cetera. And our system manages that process. So that uh, was more of a secondary market, right? Mm -hmm. Once the loans have all already been securitized. Exactly. And, you know, when you have a tranche that big of $10 million or more, you can do little things with that kind of money, like spraying the risk across all the different loans mm -hmm. so you make it safer for the lenders. Now, that's well and fine, you know, but essentially the banks don't have much control over what they're buying and it's pretty much already secure loans. It's uh, loans, leases, you know, things that have collateral. Um, so uh, we saw that there's an opportunity to put that to scale and put it on smaller transactions. We're talking about, you know, anywhere from $3,000 to $300,000 and still have the benefits of securization by spreading the risk across a certain uh, pool of the same class and same currency, you know, and essentially that's where the idea came about. And, you know, we also realized that a lot of the um, lending products out there in the market, uh, they don't really give power to the consumer. And I like to say that because, you know, as a lender on um, any of those P2P companies, you really only you know, get a few options. You don't get to choose who your KYC vendor is. You don't mm -hmm. get to choose your geographic area where you want to lend to. Mm -hmm. And most, you can probably choose, you know, the risk um, you want to lend at and the ex return you expect to get. Mm -hmm. But um, we want to change that model. We want to make it so that every lender can choose exactly which KYC agent they want to work with, mm -hmm. which um, credit scoring, credit decision, even payments partners or exchange partners they want to work with. And it becomes kind of free-for-all market where, you have multiple vendors who have, you know, their own specialties in different geographical oh, regions. Yeah, like, yeah. you know, um, Equifax and TransUnion aren't going to do well in Southeast Asia where 80% sure. of the people are unbanked, right? Sure. And, um, don't have a credit file. So we are trying to give um, power back to everybody in the ecosystem that we're building so that they can offer their services at whatever cost they wish and also um, 
you know, market rules kind of thing where the best value of when the best service comes to light. Okay, so you covered a lot of topics there. Let's um, let's let's just kind of assess where we are right now in terms of the platform. So, which markets is FinTrucks initially trying to address, both from a geographic standpoint as well as um, what level of borrowers and lenders are you trying to cater to? Yeah, so we're starting off in um, Singapore and Canada. Canada, because we um, the the Robocoder Corporation, the company behind the software of FinTrucks is very well connected in Canada. You know, again, a lot of the banks are customers, insurance companies and the like. So it has a very easy lending um, ground to start off with. We have a lot of lenders to help us out there. Okay. But Singapore is, you know, very good. It's, it's geographically positioned to be close to um, China, Indonesia and um, India. And those mm-hmm. are the places where really affordable and safe financing is needed. You mentioned, mm-hmm. you asked the question, you know, what kind of borrowers are you trying to attract? Well, a lot of the team members at FinTrucks have had the experience of spending a lot of time and money to build up a business. But even if you have a finance degree or an MBA, uh, inherently unexpected things do happen and you need cash flow for some unexpected issues, right? Sure. An analogy I like to make is, you know, if you're a small restaurant owner and you spent a lot of time and money building up your first restaurant, but all of a sudden, you know, four months in, you're still where your fridge breaks down. Now that's a ten thousand dollar fix that you don't have, right? right? You can right. go to the bank, and the bank says, "Well, you're in brand new business. You have no business credit history. Why should I lend to you? I don't trust you." Mm-hmm. Right? And then you go to a loan shark, and the loan shark says, "Well, that's eighty percent interest, please." Now at that point, really, you have two options. One is you go out of business slowly because you can't afford a high interest loan, mm-hmm. or you go out of business today because that fridge or your stove is mission critical. You know, you right. can't run a restaurant without those two items. Sure. So we're trying to help you know those small comp- those small businesses and startups get the funding they need to get over these cash flow issues, right? The reason why the banks don't want to lend to them is because one, it's very complex. You know, it's really hard to score a borrower when they have no uh, strong business credit history, and mm-hmm. you know, uh, we're doing we're fixing that um, for the lenders, the, which are the banks, by doing alternative credit scoring uh, using social media verification, behavioral sciences, psychometric scoring, and the like. You know? mm-hmm. And the second thing is, you know, it's risky, right? If you lose the money, uh, if, if the borrower's default and there's no collateral, then the banks don't get anything. Right. So we solve that as well by, you know, spreading the risk over the different pools of uh, loans and if one defaults, we can cover it from another and so on and so forth. That's called cross collateralization. Okay. So that's how we provide some levels of insurances for the lenders. And also we have a 5% of our token is also a um, reserve for mm-hmm. any unexpected defaults at the very last level of our uh, credit answers, like to call them like our levels of, in, of that acts like insurances for the uh, lenders and uh, you know, we think it's a very sustainable model. We think it's a very strong way to help these lenders that have never been able to tap into this, you know, SME business that are, you know, startups and help them thrive. Okay. So let's, um, <clears throat> that, I mean, it's really fantastic how you're trying to, in many ways, fulfill the same mission that we are here at COIN, which is to help democratize finance. And I think that's at core what you're doing. Um, Tell me about how the blockchain is playing a role in this ecosystem. Yeah, so you know, obviously, at one spectrum of it, it's a you know general ledger of things, right? It's a secure, maybe blah blah mm. blah. People know this, you know, that's just the basic basic sure. um, benefit of blockchain. Sure. Uh, what we're doing actually is um, more than that. Uh, for one, you know, I mentioned we had several levels of you know, credit enhancers, the mm-hmm. access insurances for mm-hmm. um, these lenders. Mm-hmm. And we envision one of the levels, um, pretty much, you know, the fourth or fifth level, that's how many insurances we have now, you think about that, um, to be our everyday token holders, right? Imagine that you don't have the funds to fund a loan by yourself, but mm-hmm. you still want to have a role in FinTrucks. Mm-hmm. Well, you can take your token, invest it into our platform, and have and act as a guarantor for a particular mm. loan. Right. Now you're earning a percent of the interest because now the lender is feeling safer, right? You're gonna your collateral; it's already covering that loan, and you know 
uh, you get to earn an interest rate on that. Now, that's one of our ways that we're using our token to benefit this ecosystem. So I just want to pause it. This is really interesting what you've done here. So what you're saying is that a, 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 a an FTX holder can actually take a risk position in the lending process Correct. and essentially provide the collateral to facilitate loans in a borrower that they may believe in. They may not themselves have enough capital, mm -hmm. but they do believe in that borrower. They've done their research based on the analytics that you can provide on the platform. Right. And they're saying, I'm going to post my FTX as collateral um, and that they'll take the first loss potentially if the borrower defaults. But <clears throat> by posting that collateral, they'll also be able to participate in some of the return on that lending facility. Correct. So right now, if you're trying to find a guarantor to back up your uh, loan, right? Um, usually it's your brother, your sister, your mother, your father, someone that believes in you and trusts in you and, you know, just wants to help you get your first loan. Mm. Um, we're trying to change that model by saying, hey, you know, why can't everyone be everyone's guarantor? Sure. Right? For the right amount of money, for the right amount of compensation, sure. Why not? Right. And th that really opens the door so that you mm. don't have to rely on family members to right. cover, you know, your. Uh, right. Credit history. Kind of right. Thing. So tell me about some of the metrics and tools that are available for the for the lenders or for the guarantors on the platform. Some of the sort of the non-traditional metrics yeah. that maybe are not available to the typical bank that's on the corner street that's lending out um, to, to small businesses. Exactly. Yeah, so one thing too, you know, you put your money in a bank, they're using that money for something, but you have no idea what, right? Mm -hmm. You're just happily earning your small, you know, 1%, 2% interest, and you know, that's the end of it. Uh, we're making it so that you have full control over who you're lending to. Obviously, mm -hmm. you can set it so that, you know, ah, I trust and trust whatever that it's in this, you know, uh, risk profile B, who is, you know, a medium risk uh, borrower, you know, for 12% interest, I'll lend to them no matter what, and mm. power, power to the platform, right? Mm. But on the flip side, you can also make it so that you're manually verifying each one. Think of it as like Airbnb. I'm not sure how many of our viewers use it, but there's Instant Book, right? And there's the, the ones where you have to kind of wait for the um, host to vet you and then say, oh, I want you as, a, mm. as, as my guest. Okay. We're doing it kind of that way, so where that, you know, if a lender so chooses, they can see all the metrics about the borrower. And this is including the um, uh, social media aspect, the psychometric scoring, behavioral sciences. Like one thing our partners have already found out, which is very, very interesting to me is, if people do the same habit, have the same habit every single day, they go on the same bus exactly at eight o'clock in the morning to, and get to work at exactly 8.29, right in time for work, they are more likely to pay back their loan because they follow a set rule. They are going mm. to follow a, um, a a precise payment plan mm. every month. They're going to pay it back on time. Now that's yeah. just one of the many ways where we figured out how to use this kind of tracking mm. to um, you know uh, build a credit file on people who don't have a file. Mm. Uh, on top of that, you know natural mm. language processing, right? You can see people. Um, obviously anonymous data, right? But their texts, their emails, etc. And if the borrower so choose so chooses to give this information to um, the KYC vendor, mm -hmm. then they can enjoy better interest rates because that can give the uh, borrower, the lender more security that hey, based on this um, analytics, you're a safer borrower. Now, obviously, the lenders won't know how to read all this interesting information, mm -hmm. right? But our credit um, modelers do, and they'll compile a package based on all this information that they've gotten mm. and say, ah, this is, you know, really a medium risk board. But if you want to see why, here's our full report. Mm. So that, that's how we're doing it. Do the lenders actually use some of the FTX tokens to pay for those enhanced credit reports? Or is that just simply part of the service and the ecosystem? Yeah, so I'm very happy you asked that question. <clears throat> so the token um, on top of being, you know, as that, you know, level of collateralization, it's also, our basic units within our ecosystem. What that means is everyone uses the token. The borrower and the lenders pay the token as transaction fee to the platform is very low, it's 1%, mm -hmm. um, to use our services mm -hmm. to be instantly matched to each other. Mm -hmm. The third party agencies that are on our platform, so I'm talking about KYC, identity, mm -hmm. AML, credit mm -hmm. scoring, credit modeling, payments mm -hmm. and exchanges, mm -hmm. they all get paid in our FTX token. Mm. And they 
so you see how the FTX token has a kind of a cycle, mm. and essentially the value of our token only increases as the demand on our platform rises. Sure. So the more loans we facilitate, and that's sure. really one of the ways where we drive the token ecosystem. Right. Fantastic. I mean, it's um, it's incredible. So let's talk about the ecosystem sure. and something we've talked about a few times before. And people will know that I'm a big believer in projects that have MVPs or are close to having an MVP. Sure. So so tell us about the first um, where you are at in your life cycle in terms of bringing this ecosystem to life. Yeah. So you know, even during the ice uh, before the ISO even happened, uh, we made sure that we had a MVP out a prototype on our websites you know you can find it in the header it's called demo um essentially we wanted to showcase our ability to create uh what we're saying we're creating uh, what, what i want what i want to emphasize is we're using a no code generation um development for our uh, platform what that means is we want to make it so that any contract a smart contract that is can be generated just by selecting the individual parameters that the lenders want to set out. So um, one example is, let's say the lender wants a risk package B. Again, this is in the middle of the road, you know, not that risky, but not that safe either. And mm -hmm. it's around 12% interest return, right? But they want to go in deeper. They want to say, hey, if they have a FICO score, which is, you know, a credit score, um, uh, that's over 720, well, mm -hmm. I want to give them a better rate because I trust that more and more. So I'm going to give them, you know, two basis point, two percent off their interest rate. Now that kind of minute change can be replicated many, many times depending on what kind of underwriting they want to do. A lot of banks already do their own underwriting and they don't trust anyone else's, right? Mm. So we let them have a chance to plug and play their own underwriting and still have no problem generating a smart contract out to accommodate that parameter. That's the power of our no-code development. And we made sure that our prototype showcases that. Right now, if you go to our prototype and you select any of the parameters, you can see that all of those change within the smart contract and it's instantly deployed on our private network. Now, sorry, I just want to make sure I got that straight sure. so for our audience. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so what you're saying is that the, the Fintrux platform allows for underwriters that already have their own analytics and criteria for underwriting to actually create a smart contract onto the Fantrux platform and fund loans that meet their existing criteria. Is yeah. that right? And this is without coding. That's the beauty of it is that we can do that without coding. They simply drag and drop their parameters. They want to do minute changes on, 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 the, uh, on the numbers, right? And then it's out pretty open. And that's what we can do with our generation platform. This is incredible. Okay. Right. Incredible. Yeah. So moving on from that, you know, right now I'm very happy to tell our audience that uh, in our last week we funded our first loan. Um, it's a three hundred thousand dollars Singaporean loan uh, in, in Singapore, and that's just our first test case of the platform on our internal alpha to see how everything works, and it worked very smoothly. We're very happy with the progress. Um, moving on in the next two months, we're going to be facilitating twelve borrowers and six lenders on our platform to use on a daily basis, and we're integrating with all our partners uh, to make sure that happens. So this is why I've been traveling a lot. I don't know if people have been following my uh, tweets, but I've been in uh, San Francisco in the last two weeks. I've been in Malaysia, I've been in Singapore, now I'm in Tokyo. So, you know, just a little ideas of um, where we're- We're going out for dinner after the same. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. But yeah, like we're, we're very happy that, you know, our development's going really, really well. and. Um, with the integration of our first integral partners, mm -hmm. we're going to make sure that our Q4, when we go to have general availability, is that everything's ready. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the first set of identity partner, first sets mm -hmm. of uh, um, uh, payments, first sets of exchanges, first sets of you know uh, credit modelers, and they're all ready to work and uh, help facilitate this ecosystem. So you talked about the role of the FTX in the ecosystem. So it's the the borrowers and the lenders for being able to access the platform are paying a fee in the FTX. Mm -hmm. It's the other service providers, they'll be providing those services, like the credit scoring and enhanced metrics, and you pay for those services in FTX. So it's a really well-developed ecosystem. But in terms of the actual exchange of value between those funding the loan and those um, seeking the funding, what is the exchange of value that's occurring there? Is it still using fiat or are we exchanging in Bitcoin? 
or, or using FTFs? Like, how is that going to work? Yeah, so I'm happy you asked that. And, you know, I think you noticed that I've mentioned exchange partners a few mm. times, right? So obviously the easiest way to do things is if it's in the same currency. So we're going to prioritize same currency loans always. So if someone's trying to lend out in Singaporean dollars, we're mm. going to try to find a borrower that's looking for Singaporean dollars for him. So there's, sure. you know, no, it's not as messy. You don't have to do the exchange rate currency, you know, and there's a, there's a lot of uh, conversion around it, but there's a lot of, you know, minute things that don't make it as fluid or as fast as it could be if mm -hmm. the loan was in the same currency. Now, if it is in a different currency, however, let's say there's only, you know, a few um, lenders, they're all doing ETH, right? And the borrowers are wanting, um, uh, Japanese yen, Singaporean dollar, Canadian dollar, US mm. dollar, what have you, then we'll have to do a conversion. And we're working with exchanges to do that. Um, one thing we're really uh, proud of is the Thank way you. we yeah, the way we pick our exchanges is that we want to make sure they work within our ecosystem. We're not mm. arbitrarily choosing you know, who has the highest volume, who has the most user base. That stuff's important. But we also want to make sure that they are open to be working with us in our ecosystem to grow it together and scale together. And that's one of the main things we want to push. Fantastic. So, you know, <clears throat> I guess, you know, again, this is, I'm hearing a really clear theme here that you're really trying to democratize finance. Correct. So you're breaking down the barriers of the traditional lender and borrower relationship um, where a borrower potentially sitting in, in Jakarta could access lenders that are maybe based in Tokyo. Correct. Um, but that brings up another important question, especially in, in the lending space about regulatory framework and adherence to lending rules. Um, in the United States, for example, where I'm from, you know, every state might have a different regulation about, um, about lending. So how are you dealing with the you know, not only the technology problems here, but sort of the regulatory adherence issues that any sort of lending platform has to deal with. Yeah, so that's always the thing. Regulations is, you know, it's really important to make sure everyone's protected in, um, especially in lending. Mm -hmm. um, so we 100% understand, you know, the need for it to be so scrutinized. Um, the way it works for us is that, um, we have to get a P2P lending license, um, and that's for our platform. And we probably have to get that in every jurisdiction we operate. Um, that, however, gets facilitated much easier when we start working with our lenders, who are, again, uh, mostly going to be financial institutions, mm -hmm. so banks, insurance companies, finance companies, even P2P lending companies that already have their own licenses to lend. Mm -hmm and they can work on our platform to facilitate that process as well. So we're actively looking for local partners in different jurisdictions to work with us, to build out our platform, to um, use the license together to quickly expand across multiple geographical areas at once. I see, so it's really about partnerships to be able to scale up your business mm -hmm. um, horizontally. What about, <clears throat> where do you see this going, Conrad? Do you see, this platform potentially being used um, in the in at the investment banking level, or do you see this more for serving the unbanked or middle class people, or, or or all of the above? We're trying to make it all of the above, and you know our our goal right now to start right is unsecured loans for small business owners. Mm. Right. Uh, as a small business owner, again, without any cash flow and especially without any collateral, it's really hard to get a loan. And we want to target that need. We want to help them get the money they need mm. and get it now. Right. Not in three months, not in six months, like, you know, sometimes working with a bank would be, but instead within minutes. And, mm. you know, that, that's the class we're trying to aim for. And uh, I think people have uh, seen, too, we recently partnered with Sentinel Chain. Um, who are trying to help the unbanked by helping the farmers, right, in mm. Southeast Asia, Bangladesh, nice. et cetera. And, you know, that, you know, creates a new opportunity for us where we can even start servicing the farmers who, you know, maybe have a bad year. Um, they need some like, uh, cash flow to um, tide over the bad year of um, crops they, they had, um, or, you know, maybe one of their cows died and they need to get a new one. Those are the kind of things we're exploring and really the beauty of the ecosystem, again, I keep hampering this, but to us what it means is we're working with partners, working with as many people as possible to serve as, as many as people as possible, mm -hmm. right? We don't want to hold it all to ourselves. We want to expand diversely 
And really any new company that partners with us, give us a new access point into a whole new market that you know, we probably couldn't get to ourselves. Mm. So we're very happy that we have this opportunity to meet all these fantastic people in the blockchain space and the traditional space that want to work together with FinTrucks and grow this together. Fantastic. So <clears throat> you really great, you know, really very well articulated how Fintrex is making the pie bigger in the lending and borrowing market. And really I can see how GDPs can really grow because a lot of times what holds back, especially in developing economies, is lack of access to credit. Um, people much smarter than me have written many papers about this topic. <laughs> but it's an interesting question as well. On the other side of the coin, who do you think is sort of going to lose out if Fintrucks platform takes hold and you have a more efficient market um, connecting borrowers and lenders. There must be some sort of existing stakeholder that may be under pressure from, from this development. Yeah, so this is a very good point, Seth. I'm so happy you bring it up because, you know, a lot of people try to say big things like, oh, we're getting rid of the banks. Our, our, pro our, our product is going to remove all the banks. And we're like, they're in their institution. It's not going to be that easy. And we don't want to do that either because the, the fact of the matter is they have their value and the value is that they have the money. Mm. They have the resources, the money and the connections to get things going. And they're actively looking for ways on how to get into the blockchain space, mm. right? Just the banks within Canada alone, they spent well over you know, $500 million now mm. into their you know, Ethereum R&D, blockchain R&D and so forth. Mm. And what our platform, you know, why it shines to them is because it creates an easy way for them to enter the blockchain space without having to invest anything. One thing we really want to uh, promote is no upfront costs. It doesn't make sense, right? Even for borrowing, you know, why should you have to pay to get a quote? You know, if you need money, you don't have the money to pay to get a quote to see that, oh, I can't afford this loan anyway, right? So, chicken and the egg. Chicken and the egg, right? So we were making it so that, you know, not just that for the borrowers, but even for our partners getting involved, we don't charge them any upfront costs. It's only on a transaction fee, you know, when they're getting the service from the borrowers or lenders, whoever you're servicing. Mm. Um, and, and we think that's very important. Um, and moving onwards from that too, you know, you mentioned who might, you know, what stakeholders might lose, right? Mm -hmm. Well, obviously the first uh, thing that comes to mind is P2P lenders, right? Or traditional financing mm -hmm. uh, companies. But we say, no, they're not losing out because we're actively looking for them to help build our system as well. Because think about this, a traditional, let's say a equipment leasing company, can actually come to our platform and offer that as a unique asset class, as an additional collateral level. Remember the credit enhancers mm -hmm. for our borrowers to say, "Hey, you know, I want a loan, but hey, if I, I have some equipment lying around, mm -hmm. what if I use this as collateral? Maybe mm -hmm. I'll get a better interest rate." And they mm -hmm. will, right? So every time a new lender come, a new partner comes on board, uh, even if it's a traditional lending company they can bring something unique to our platform and that's what we work with. And for P2P lenders, that's even more interesting because they have capital and they have underwriting that they've already done for a mm -hmm. lot of different uh, borrowers out there. For one, the capital means that they can diversify their portfolio and put some in FinTrucks and reduce their risk overall, right? But the second thing is they have their underwriting and we want to help them monetize that. You know, companies like Lending Club, you know, Lending Loop, Cabbage, they all have really well-developed underwriting that they don't want to use anybody else's, right? Because mm -hmm. they, they spend so much R&D on their own. Sure. So if they're a lender on our platform, they're going to use their own. But what if we make it so that they could sell that? So they could be a credit modeler as well, mm. right? And they could be an And agent. they can monetize all of their R&D that they've done to this point. Exactly. Fantastic. And they'll get credited in FTX. FTX, <laughs> gotta own it. Exactly. Conrad, this has been really, really helpful. Um, really excited about the project. Um, I know Tokyo is a financial capital that you will be back here at some point soon, <laughs> hopefully when we move to another office. And um, I would really love to have you back again to talk about your next big phases when, when the projects continue to develop. But thank you very much for coming today, tell us about, telling us about the project. And um, I'm really excited about it. Again, FTX is now trading on cryptos um, against ETH, BTC. And we're looking forward to hearing more great things about the project. All right. Thank you, Seth. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>